Okay, our last speaker before the break is uh, uh, Noam uh, Stern Guinnessar. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, she's talking, she's a really cool story, talking about decoding CMB. Okay, so first of all, I want to thank the organizer for the opportunity to present our work. And my name is Noam, and I'm a postdoc in Jonathan Weissman Lab in uh, UCSF. And I'll tell you about the work we've done to decode the proteome of human cytomegalovirus. So, a few, few words about human CMV, because we already heard about it. It's the largest known human viral genome. It's around 240 kilobasepairs of double stranded DNA. And the, the first genome was sequenced 22 years ago, and since then, many other strains have been sequenced. And based on these sequences, uh, the, the current estimate is that the virus is encoding for around 200 open reading frames. Um, I want to emphasize that although these, these annotations uh, were very useful for the field, and many of these annotations um, were uh, now experimentally val validated, the annotations are, are completely computational, computationally based, and they had some assumptions to make about an off, uh, mainly about the length of an off. So people will count an off if it's usually longer than 80 amino acids. Um, so we still don't really understand what's the full coding potential of HCMV. And following these lines, although there were some microarray attempts to measure a viral gene expression in lung infection, and these were very difficult because we don't have a complete understanding of the transcript and the OFFs, and so we still don't have an, any general overview of what's being expressed when. Although, again, for some individual genes, there is a lot of work that's been done, but nothing generally looking at the CMV. And so when I joined Jonathan Weinsman lab, we decided to use some of the tools developed in the lab to try and tackle some of these issues. And Nick Ingolia in the lab published in 2009 a method which, is, which we call ribosome profiling, which is basically based on the observations that ribosome protect, physically protect a 30 base per fragment of the mRNA that they are translating. And then if we take cells and we freeze the ribosome wherever they are, and then digest the unprotected RNA with RNAs, then we can purify these small fragments, deep sequence them, and get a very clear picture of what's being translated in the cell. And Nick also developed an additional, uh, let's say, a trick, which is based on the same method, but now the drug that's being used is our intoning. And our intoning block only translation initiation, it doesn't affect elongating ribosomes. So if we treat cell with foreign toning and let the ribosome chase, and then we make the libraries, we get a very strong enrichment of ribosome that were uh, initiating translation, and therefore we can really see where we can really experimentally identify translation, translation initiation sites. So the idea was to use this method to infect cells with CMV for 5, 24, and 72 hours, and then make libraries with cycloaxamide or no drug just to avoid artifact. And this will give us the distribution of the ribosome along the along transcript, so basically what's being translated, to do our intoning treatment and then get translation initiation site, and then measure mRNA abundance to get a view of what's being transcribed. So this is an example of how the data look like for one viral protein, UL25. For the cycloaxamide and no drug, we get distribution of the ribosome from the AUG to the stop as, ex as expected. With the intoning treatment, we have a very strong peak at the AUG where translation initiates, so it really helped us to define what's being translated. And then when we made the mRNA lab uh, libraries, we used a small tweak that enabled us to define the five arm end of the transcript. So you can see this is the mRNA read, this is where the mRNA start, and this is where it ends, and we can actually get the accurate ending point by looking for, se for sequences that has the poly A tail. So overall, we can really get a nice picture, picture of what's getting translated. And so we immediately saw that there are a lot of surprising examples of translation, and I'll just show you a few examples. And these are just examples, they are very profound. Uh, so we see many, many UOFs, and here is one gene, UL139, and then you can see two UOFs in the 5 UTR of this gene. And I have to say, there were some uh, UOFs very well characterized in the CMV, but we see that almost, almost every viral, 
Basel Open Reading Firm has a UOF in the 5.0 ETR. We see some very nice antisense translations, and this is an extreme example, but it shows the point very well. So here there is, under minus trends, US one, UL, UL150, which is very well translated, but under plus trend, we see another OF which is being translated, which is actually being spliced and was never annotated before. Um, we see many examples of near cognate OFs, so OFs that doesn't, don't start with an AUG, and this is an example of a CUG OF that starts here and ends in the AUG. Some of them don't chase with turning toning, which suggests that maybe it's another. I mean, basically, we don't know why, but it's something we observe and potentially suggests some other initiation mechanism. And we see many examples of short off. So here you can see just one short off that has an independent transcript. The transcript starts here. It's under minus trend. And then there is a 30 amino acid protein that's being translated. And we see many, many examples of internal offs. Here you see one example of UL38 that starts here. That's the main off. And then there is another initiation starts here and then a truncated version of the protein. So this, this is an internal initiation in the same frame. So we get a truncated version. And we see some example of internal initiation in different frames, which actually generate an independent sequence. So here you see UL10, which is actually hardly getting translated, but there is a more dominant short protein, which is 42 amino acid, which is out of frame. And I have to say, this is something that could not be picked by computational methods. Um, and then the last example, uh, in the CV genome, there are some very well characterized non-coding RNAs. Uh, including the beta 2.7, which is the, one of the most abundant transcripts in CMV infected cells. And this transcript was shown to inhibit apoptosis in a very nice paper in 2007. And what we see is that actually this RNA, non coding RNA, is getting translated, and we could map around 11 open reading frames, short open reading frames. Two of them, one which is 84 amino acids, and one of them which is 86 amino acid, we could confirm by mass spectrometry analysis. So these are really getting translated. And for a lot of the things I'll show you later, we also got some confirmation by mass spectrometry. So this prompts us to try and um, use the data we collected to annotate what's being translated in CMV infected cells from the viral point of view. And we use the machine learning approach to predict translation initiation sites using the internal data we collected. And we identified 762 translation, translated OFs. A big portion of them, 243, are below 20 amino acids. So these are probably U off, and we don't think they have any function by themselves. Uh, but you can see that we also identified many proteins, which are, let's say, between 50 to 150 amino acids. And these could be functional. And I guess additional work will have to figure out what's exactly functional and what has a more probably the regulatory role. And you can see that we also identified some long proteins. Most of them are just corrected, corrections to previous annotations or um, identification of unrecognized splice junction. And another very useful thing you can get from ribosome profiling is actually measuring the expression levels of different genes. So what's being expressed and how much in every point of infection. So if you have many footprints, of course, this suggests high expression. And if you have low footprints, this suggests low expression. And we can actually discriminate between the cases in which we have low mRNA, and that's why there is low expression. Or maybe there is a lot of mRNA, but it's not efficiently getting translated. I won't get into this, although there are some interesting examples in the CMV genome, but I just want to point out that we can get to this information as well. So when we look globally and what's being expressed during the three time points of infection we collected, we see very nice uh, clusters and very strong temporal regulation, as was expected. Uh, what's interesting is that the viral gene, CMV genes are historically divided to immediate early, early, and late. And it seems that although we collected just three time points, it seems that this is oversimplifying things. And you can see here a very interesting cluster of genes that actually start up, then go down, and then go up. So I think there is a lot to learn from what we've collected. And this is looking at all the OFs we've identified, novel and previously annotated. I'm done, that's the last slide. So another interesting observation was that a lot of this temporal regulation that we see is actually coming from changes in the five prime ends. And I'll try to walk you through this figure. It's a little complicated. And, and this is just one example in the genome. We actually see see this effect for 85% of the transcript we identified. 
So you can see, so this is the three time points of infection, five hours, 24 hours, and 72 hours. At five hours, we see one transcript that starts here, goes down, and it includes three canonical ORFs, US 20, US 19, and US 18. And since this is cap-dependent translation, only the first ORF is getting translated, US 20. And then in 24 hours, we now see two different transcripts, one that starts here, one that starts here, and then US 20 is getting translated, but also US 18. And then in 72 hours, we see now three different transcripts, the long one, the, sh the mediocre one, and then a very short one. And if you zoom in on the short one, you can see that at 72, 72 hours post-infection, we have another initiation site here, and then there is a truncated version of US 18 that's being translated, and it's actually getting translated from this short transcript. And we validated some of these changes in the transcript by Nordens. So to summarize, uh, we see that the CMV genome is much more complex than what was previously estimated. We think our work provides a great framework for studying CMV and context for mutational studies. Um, a point I didn't mention is, as I told you, we identified many short proteins, and it's not clear if they have function on the peptide level, but even if they don't, they should have a major effect on the antigenic potential that CMV will have, because they are very likely to present, be presented in MHC class one. And we think this technique is a, very, is a great tool to annotate complex genomes, and especially complex virus that has very, very many overlapping genes. And our work shows that alternative transcript cell sites are actually very important for temporal regulation for viral gene expression. Um, I just want to thank everyone. So first of all, Jonathan Weissman, which is an amazing PI, and although he's not a virologist, he always has very good input. Ben Weisberg, which done a lot of the computational analysis. Nick Ngolia, that developed the method, and all, the, all of Jonathan's lab. Matthias Mann and Annette Mikalski, which done a lot of math spectrometry analysis that I didn't talk about. And Human Frontiers for, for funding. Just on time. Mm -hmm. 10 minutes. <laughs> Uh, some of uh, um, CMV uh, encodes microRNAs, and some right. of these microRNAs regulate viral mRNA transcripts. Right. Have you looked at them, at, at those, and are they, do they show a different profile when you look at the ribosomes? So, I mean, I didn't specifically look at, look at those. There are now two different papers looking, using ribosome profiling to see how microRNA affect translation. Um, I mean, for one of them, I can, I can say, I think, like when the microRNA is going up, it seems translation efficiency is going down. But I didn't like spend a lot of time looking at that because I feel other people addressed it in a better system, so. Uh, one more question. Uh, do you have evidence whether some of these small peptides, the 20 amino acids or 30 or 40 amino acids, are actually uh, expressed in a, whether they're in the cell? So, uh, we. I mean, I have a slide, but we've done a lot of mass spectrometry analysis. The shortest thing we could get by mass spec is 50 amino acid. Mm -hmm. uh, we definitely covered a lot of things between 50 to 100, yeah. but we were not able to detect anything below 50. It could come from two reasons. One, these are just degraded, yeah. and so we can't get them. And two, it, the shorter the button is, the harder it is to get it right. by mass spec. It's so, very interesting to see whether they are actually presented with MHC class. So that's well. actually one experiment we are. Cool trying to do, and it should be relatively straightforward.